Hello, everyone, and welcome back for part two of this two-part uh, virtual science camp on sound. So for those of you who weren't with us for the first part, we went over some of the basics of sound generation, how we can make a sound of different pitches. And this session is going to be a little bit, bit more advanced. And this one is going to focus on measuring the speed of sound with a couple of different methods. Um, so just to quickly recap on a couple of the ways we uh, generated sound, we looked at a couple of different methods of making sound of different pitch. One of the basic ones was using water glasses with different levels. So we can see here we have different pitches. So that was a percussion method. And then we were using columns of air in bottles of water. <laughs> And even my adjustable one, I should have left that closer by. I moved it out of the way so I wouldn't get any of the equipment for this one wet, but forgot I was going to use it. So the adjustable water bottle where we can change the pitch in a column of air. And we'll be using that for the second method of measuring the, the speed of sound. So I hope all of you have materials so you can follow along at home. Uh, the materials you should have are some cardboard rolls from toilet paper and paper towels. They can still have the paper towel on them because we're just using the inside of it for this one. Uh, and you should have at least one uh, smartphone with the app Firefox on it. Um, if you have two, that's even better for the first part. If you don't have two and there's not two of you, don't worry, there's an echo method for it. And if you don't even have one, that'll just be one part where you won't follow along. Uh, that part will last about 10, maybe 15 minutes, and then the second part will be about the same amount of time. Uh, are there any questions before we begin? And just by a thumbs up, either showing me on camera or giving the thumbs up reaction, uh, or even just holding things up, can you let me know if you have a smartphone with Firefox on it? Excellent. So I'm seeing lots of thumbs up, uh, so we're ready to go. And this is a really cool app that uses your phone for all kinds of measuring tools. So I'd encourage you to play around with it and see some of the neat stuff we can do. Uh, it looks like Rachel doesn't have one. So you're just going to follow along and see what we're doing. It's not a big deal if you're not able to do that part of it. OK, sorry about that, Rachel. Um, so using the app, for some reason, when I was trying to get things set up for this session, I couldn't figure out how to screen share from an app on my phone. So I'm just going to tell you how to get to the acoustic stopwatch. It should like be fairly basic from looking on that, but sorry, I'm not doing the more high tech actual screen share. So when you open up the app, you'll want to scroll down to the fourth set of menus or no fifth. And it's in the timers. If you installed it in French, I think it's chronometro. Uh, I'm not sure what it is in other languages. Uh, and the acoustic stopwatch is the first one there. And that just uses the microphone of your phone um, to time when like physical things happen. There's two different values there. The first one is the threshold. And the second one is the minimum delay. The minimum delay we're not too worried about. Um, that you can set for a higher value if you're doing an experiment where you need things that'll take a certain amount of time and you don't want your result canceled by that. By default, 0.1 seconds is pretty good for the experiment that we'll be doing. Um, so you don't need to play around with that. The threshold is how loud it will be when you set it off. So I'm going to change mine just to 0 0.01 to do a trial for that. And then anytime I go to reset and do the experiment again, then it'll set off the timer immediately because that's way too sensitive. So I'm going to change it here to 0.2 seconds. Sorry, 0.2 audible units. And there are arbitrary units, and it's not standardized from one phone to another. And they're about the sound of my voice. Once you have the threshold uh, set, so I'm, I'm recommending start it at 0 0.2. Uh, if, if you don't have a second person and a second phone, maybe 0 0.1, because you'll need to pick up the echo. Uh, and I'm just going to step outside because my apartment is small enough. My balcony is actually longer than any distance inside the apartment. So I'm going to be doing this one outside. So I'm just going to walk outside and you'll have a beautiful view of uh, the 11th arrondissement in Paris. Hopefully I don't drop my computer off my balcony. Hi. 
Okay, so here the experimental setup, we've got two chairs set up here, and we're going to vary the distance between two phones. Uh, remember, I said I'll cover how to do this with an echo if you just have one phone. So there I have my wonderful assistant there, and I have the acoustic stopwatch set so that it'll go off any time it hears a loud sound. So I'm going to need to stop talking or I'll keep setting that up. But the basics of it is I'm going to clap my hands. The sound from my hands clapping is going to set off the timer on my first phone. And then it's going to set off the timer on the second phone, which right now is placed exactly one meter away. Well, now it's exactly one meter away. And so the time between the two will be the time it takes sound to travel one meter. Then my assist assistant's going to clap her hands next to the other phone and the sound from her hand clapping will turn off the timer on her phone, then go by my phone and turn off my timer. Uh, so we're gonna try that out. Uh, then if you have questions on it, uh, you can ask after I've demonstrated one time with this one meter separation. So I'm just gonna be quiet for a minute, otherwise I'm gonna set off the timers. Okay, and my threshold was set too high, so I'm just gonna lower my threshold because it wasn't set off by my own clap. And I'm gonna start that one more time. Okay, and my time delay between the two claps seen on my phone was 1.840 seconds, and yours was? 1.838. So we have a difference of only 0 0.002 seconds, and that corresponds to two milliseconds it took the sound to travel one meter this way and one meter back. And then we're, we can increase the distance and measure the increase in time. Uh, as we're setting up to do it for two meters apart, are there questions about how this method works and how to try this out at home? Oh, uh, no, I'll write a sorti directo do. Okay, and there are no questions. Just before I know if I should spend much time on this, how many of you have two phones and two people? Like, is it worth me continuing on this method or skipping ahead to the... Okay, so I see at least a couple hands up. So, yes, we will go ahead with this method. From what I've shown you so far, do you understand it well enough to try and take a measurement on your own? Okay, and there's a bunch of sun in the way of my screen, so I'm not seeing my, many reactions one way or another there. To, to word it another way, if you don't understand well enough to try and carry this out at home, let me know so I explain it one more time. Okay, and if, if you've understood well enough, then I'm going to suggest you put me on mute for a minute. And that way I can keep explaining to anyone who thinks they need more explanations and you won't have me setting off your acoustic timer. So if you've uh, understood- Can I explain the, it one more time, please? Can I explain it one more time? Uh, yes. So to explain that one more time, the setup here, we have two phones which are spaced a known distance apart. So for this next trial, it's gonna be two meters. And I'm gonna set the acoustic timer so it's ready to start timing when it hears a noise. I'm gonna make a loud noise clapping here, so that noise will start my timer, and a very small delay later, the time it takes sound to get to the second phone, it'll start the second time. At some time after that, it's good if it's a small time, like only a second or two, so we're not timing something that's 10 seconds or 20 seconds, but it doesn't matter the exact time it takes my assistant to react. Some amount of time afterwards, she's going to do the exact same thing in reverse, she's going to clap, and the sound from that clap will arrive at her phone first, it will stop her timer, and then the sound will travel to my phone and stop my timer a fraction of a second later. So if we compare the time on the two phones, my time will be slightly longer than hers, and that'll correspond to the addition of the time it takes the sound of my clap to get from my phone to her phone, like the distance between the two phones. And uh, the time it takes sound to go the distance in return. Do, 
Does that make sense now with that explanation? Are you using the sequence timer? Uh, uh, no, no, just uh, like one, one run on the acoustic timer. Um, so it, it'll be hard to show when I'm, when I'm talking, I'll change the threshold. But, so just a simple timer. Just, just simple timer, like I'll, I'll show it but, as, as I clap once, although like clapping, I need both hands. So this is gonna be kind of an awkward setup. Yeah, for anyone still watching, that might make sense, like seeing the timer work just with a clap right next to it. And then resetting. So like one noise, or in this case, one clap, which is my like distinct loud noise will start it. And then one more will stop it. Did, did, did that help answer that question? Okay, so, uh, bon. pardon? C'est bon. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm going to suggest everyone who has two phones and two people to do it with this setup, turn me on mute for a minute to try that yourselves. And for those of you who have one phone or less, um, then I'm going to explain the echo uh, method so that you can do it with one phone. Um, so if, if you have two phones and you're going to do it, can you just give me a thumbs up so I can know not to expect you listening to me? Okay, so I'm seeing uh, Diane Rose. I'm seeing, I think, Alex, there's a thumbs up there. No, no thumbs up. Okay, there's at least one or two of you. So try and take a measurement that way. Uh, have me on mute. And if you don't have two phones and two scientists, then stick with me for the echo method, which I'm about to explain. Okay, so the echo method for everyone who's with me, this one's going to be a lot messier. The results won't be as reliable from it, um, but it, uh, it's a way of getting around the limitation of needing two phones. So I'm gonna do the exact same setup only now I'm going to be measuring the sound from uh, my initial clap and the sound that bounces back off of the nearest hard surface around me. In that case, with the setup of how my room is, it's going to be the ceiling above me. So I can measure the distance to my ceiling. And I've measured it earlier. Um, as most of you will know, in Paris, ceilings are reasonably high. So my ceilings, in this case, they're 2.8 meters high. Uh, that This is a high table, in case no one's noticed this. Table is reasonably high. It's 1.1 meters, so I have a distance of 1.7 meters, which is being doubled for the experiment because the sound is going up there and back again to my phone. Uh, and I'm going to have something that's a bit of a sharper sound, so it makes a cleaner echo. Hands are good because almost everyone has hands with them, uh, but I'm going to grab a pot and a spoon just to make a sharper noise from this for this. If you don't have one of those handy, feel free to do it with your hands at home. It should work as long as you don't have much background noise going on. Okay, so it's a uh, similar setup and I'm just gonna have this, this pot that I'll bang and that'll set off my timer to start and to stop. And because the echo is going to be significantly less loud than the initial sound, I'm going to need to turn my acoustic thresh threshold really low. So here on my phone, and again, uh, acoustic units for this, they're just arbitrary units. Um, it's not an absolute value, so it'll vary phone to phone. Um, if a low value is too low and it's setting it off just by turning off and on your phone, then raise the number up a little bit. But for mine, 0.05, it works best for the echo method. And now I'm going to start, well, I'm gonna stop talking so I can start a run. I need to turn, uh, turn the sensor on. One point two eight seconds. And I'm gonna note that result and just repeat that one or two more times. And one of the problems with the echo method is if we have sound bouncing off of any other surface, uh, for example, I have a wall, 
that it could bounce off of. It's about the same distance as the ceiling, but the wall isn't as flat and uniform. So I'm guessing I'm not getting an echo that will appear uh, with this threshold method. Uh, and I'm just gonna repeat that a couple more times and see if I get about the same value. If not, then it means there are other weird echo effects going on. Zero point one one zero, so similar but not exactly the same. Zero point one one six. These are all seeming to be a little bit bigger than than what I, what I'd expect. Um, the the method might be a little bit uh, like might be a little bit flawed from that way. I, I think probably just because the echo method isn't nearly as reliable as the two phone method. I'm not going to hang uh, on this method too much longer. If you feel like playing around with it at home afterwards, I'd suggest it like that's a cool investigation to do on your own. But just in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the air column residence because that'll work a lot better in a single phone setup. Um, with multi, uh, multi phones, like I think we'll have Diane Rose come back and tell us how those results were for her. Um, but for most people here, I think it'd be more useful if we move to the, the air column residence with resonance with the uh, cardboard tubes. Okay, so for, for that one, I recommended having a frequency generator on your phone and I recommended a specific app but if you didn't get that app, you can also use the one on Firefox. It's just you need to tap in different frequencies. Um, the one I had recommended, I'm just gonna turn the volume on, on my phone here. And you can hear it's just making a steady single tone, right? And it's kind of annoying. And I can change the pitch. So I'm gonna look at a phenomenon, a phenomenon called resonance and look at the resonant frequency of different lengths of column uh, of air. And that's what I hope for you guys to do at home. Um, before doing that with the phone, just a really quick explanation of resonance because a lot of you might not be so, so familiar with it as a concept. So I've got this set up. I'm not expecting you to make this setup at home. I'm just demonstrating it. So don't worry, I didn't tell you how to have string or corks for this one. Okay, so holding up this set of string and corks. And I'm going to demonstrate resonance first by holding them all still. And then I'm going to concentrate on one of them. So in this case, I'm going to concentrate on the little one. And I want the little one to start swinging. And we, see, we can see the little one swinging quite noticeably. The other ones are hardly moving. Now I'm going to concentrate on the long one. And it's hard to make only the long one move but we see the long ones moving significantly more than the little one. The medium one's kind of moving a lot too. I'm going back to the little one. So getting the little one moving a lot more than the big one. Now this is a fun demonstration of resonance. I saw at the uh, University of Valencia in Spain uh, from a professor there called uh, Chantal uh, Ferrer Roca who has a whole bunch of wonderful physics demos. Uh, if you understand Spanish or Valencian, uh, I'll give you guys a link to that because they've got really good demos there. But the idea with resonance there, you guys probably didn't even see me swinging the tube. If you did, you noticed I was only swinging it a little bit. But if I swing it at the same frequency that the middle one is rocking back and forth with, we see it rocks back and forth pretty big and the other ones barely move. If I swing it at the frequency the big one will tend to go back and forth with, we get it moving a lot more than the others, but getting the middle one kind of going a lot too, so maybe I should adjust the lengths. But 
hopefully you get the principle that if I'm pushing it at just the right time, we get one length that we'll see vibrating a lot more than the other, even to the point of losing the, co uh, the core. So because sound is a vibration, then sound in air will have resonant lengths that correspond just like with those corks on a string to giving it a boost right when it comes back. So for reasons too complicated for me to get into in like this quick session, sound will tend to reflect at either end of a hollow tube it's going through. So if I get this paper towel tube and I start generating a frequency near the end of it. Now in my case, the speaker for my phone is right at the bottom here. So I'm gonna try and pass that by the end of the two. And at most frequencies, okay, that, that's not most frequencies. I'm, I'm going to go back to a random frequency. Like here, I'm at 450 hertz. And the sound will be a little bit different going through the tube or not, but not that much different. And if I change the frequency, I'll get to one frequency where it'll be significantly louder uh, when the sound is going through the tube. And hopefully you should hear that there. Is, is my computer mic picking that up reasonably well? Okay, I'm getting some people nodding their head yes. So yeah. in this case, for this length of tube, the resonant frequency is somewhere near 555 hertz. Oh. And, and if I look at sounds near that, and, and I hear someone sighing, we can do this with quieter sounds too. And then we might notice the difference a lot more sharper with a quieter sound. And we're just looking for the frequency where we see the biggest difference in volume there. So fine tuning this one. I seem to have the biggest effect about 544 hertz. Does that make sense how I did this? And I'm, I'm gonna cut the volume off because it's kind of annoying. So my result for that, and I've, I have a chart where if you're able to do this at home, if you've understood uh, uh, what I'm asking you to do, then I want you to use the chart you can get to from the, uh, from the accompanying document. So I'm just going to share that briefly. Accompanying document here and air column resonance method results. If you uh, click on that link, it'll bring up a form where you can enter your results for the experiment. So in this case, the length of this tube is 22.5 centimeters. And the resonance <laughs> frequency here was 544. My initials for those results, if I want to see, like if I think, oh, maybe that result doesn't fit, wonder what was going on, I could go back and check. And I've submitted one set of results there. And then I can go in and try that with a different length of tube, like this toilet paper tube is shorter. So it'll have a higher pitch resonant frequency. Um, with that explanation, do you guys think you can try and find one resonant frequency, like the resonant frequency of one of your tubes at home using that method? Okay, and I'm getting some thumbs up, so please go ahead and do that now and then try and submit a result. Uh, while you're doing that, I'm just going to mute myself and go through getting one or two more results with other lengths of tube. I, I don't have a chair there. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm going to repeat that with one or two uh, more tubes that I have around the house. And if you have questions, please interrupt and ask questions about how to do this. Hopefully, we can get one result from each of you before we finish in a couple minutes.
and I've started to get a couple of results and hopefully you guys can get one or two results so that I can show you what this data means and how it can be used. So take another minute or to try and get some results. Um, I should be wrapping up soon, but hopefully we can get at least one or two more sets of results from you guys coming in. Please let me know. Please let me know if I can help guide you through how to, how to get a result. And I see some people working hard on this. So I'll, I'll leave you for an extra minute or two. We'll probably end up finishing maybe 10 minutes late. Hopefully you guys are okay with that just so we can try and get some results. Once we get two more from other people, uh, then I'll show you what these results mean. And I'll try and get one more from myself quickly while you guys are doing that. Okay, and just in the interest of time, I'm going to start talking through the results. But if you are trying to get a result at home, please uh, feel free to continue getting the result uh, so that we can add that. And it'll just appear on the result and our graph uh, in a moment, like well, as soon as you add it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to divide one uh, divided by the frequency uh, in this cell here. And that's going to give us something called the period. And that's how long it takes for one wave of the sound to go. And so you can see it's pretty small. Um, it's on the order of milliseconds. And that makes sense because that's the am amount of time it takes for one of those waves of sound uh, to travel there. And at the same time, I'm going to uh, look at the, no, I'll leave the resonant length of the tube in centimeters. Excellent, we have one more result there. Uh, thank you, AH, for submitting that result. And so now I'm just going to insert a graph of length versus period. Okay, and by default, it's doing a bar chart, which is rarely any good for science. So we're getting a scatter plot. And I won't bother labeling the axes because I'm just going to try and talk through this quickly. But I'm going to add a trend line. Uh, I've had this problem before where it's difficult with the uh, zoom menu in the way. But we get a trend line there. And I'm going to add a label that's the equation for the line. What was your saying, Marcy? So we see that trend line that's going near most of the points. And the thing that interests us here is going to be the, the slope of the trend line. So if we look at uh, period versus length, then we're dividing a, uh, a time by a distance. Oh, we, we should really reverse the axes there. Uh, let's see. Easiest way to do this with Zoom blocking some of the menus. I'm just going, and this is a bit of a sloppy method. There is a better way to do this. I'm just going to paste it uh, in another column as well. And hopefully by default, I'll have the axes set up uh, the way I want rather than wasting your time trying to set up the axes again. Okay, that's looking a lot better. And 
just going to add a trend line again. Okay, and those results, I'm a little disappointed it's not better. If we convert that to meters, that says we're expecting sound to travel at 170 meters per second. We're expecting a little more than 300. Um, so I'm not sure maybe some of the results kind of threw this off a bit. Uh, I'll need to think about that. Uh, if anyone has any questions on that or comes up with any great insights, uh, please let me know so I can get back to everyone afterwards why we're off by about a factor of two. Ah, makes perfect sense. We're not dealing with a whole wave of sound, but we're dealing with a half wave of sound in the tube. Uh, it goes down and reflects, so the resonant length corresponds to half a wavelength. So, so those results are actually surprisingly excellent. Uh, there, we'd be doubling the 170 meters per second to 340, which is almost exactly the result we're looking for. Um, so yeah, so sorry for that, that confusion, but uh, that's because the resonant length of the two will be half of the wavelength of sound, uh, not the full wavelength. So there's that factor of two I forgot about for that graph. Okay, uh, now I've, I've gone considerably over time, so I'll wrap that up uh, there. And I won't bother briefly mentioning the clapping method and uh, audio feedback, but those are two other methods uh, that could be used to measure this, the speed of sound. Um, does anyone have any quick questions for me to try and answer before I say goodbye to everyone? I, I think it was probably a little bit ambitious of me to try and do both of these methods of measuring the speed of sound in the same session, especially in like a, uh, one that was planned to be shorter. Um, so sorry if that was a little bit ambitious and I ended up going a little bit quickly on, on any of these points. Um, if you do have questions that come up afterwards, like if you're trying to do the experiments or make sense of it with the graph, then uh, please let me know, like just drop me a line and let me know what you're trying to sort out. And I'm always uh, happy to try and help out through things like that. Um, that being said, is there any burning question anyone needs to ask before I say goodbye to everyone? Okay, so I, I want to thank you everyone for joining me again. Uh, it's been great having you along for another virtual science camp. I hope to see a number of you at other ones throughout this week as well. Uh, tomorrow's one, if you haven't signed up with uh, Lucia Caro, who's a, a friend I met at the Institute of Pasteur before she moved to New York. She's going to answer questions about the, the coronavirus in her work. So that should be a really exciting one, uh, as well as the ones later in the week with people from CERN and the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research. So I hope to see everyone again soon. Um, thanks again for, for joining in these sessions and stay home and stay curious.